Hey friends out there in YouTube land or however else you found me today. I'm Robert Ham with Robert Ham Photography and I'd like to welcome you to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about what makes a professional photographer a professional photographer. And that's going to get a lot of people's feathers ruffled just a little bit. However, if you stick around through the whole thing, I think you'll agree that we've got a great place to start and we can help make the community even better together. So without further ado, let's get started. Before we jump right into it, I'd like to let you know that I enjoy your comments and I want to engage in discussion. So please, if you find this video helpful, leave a like, hit that subscribe button, and toss a comment down below. This video is for the photographer out there, but it's also for the client looking for a photographer. Since I'm talking about knowledge that I believe is important for all photographers to have, it's going to be very helpful for you choosing a photographer if you're on the client side, and it's going to be very helpful for you improving your photography if you're on the creator side. The first impression that we have to get around is that photographers just push buttons. And unfortunately, this is something that the mass media, that cell phones, and that other photographers that may decide to call themselves pro have helped to perpetuate. With the prevalence of digital cameras and the price for good digital cameras coming down and no requirement for a photographer to have any kind of certification or go to school and very little accreditation for photography across many different online and in-school mediums, there's led to a lot of people that believe themselves to be photographers or believe themselves to have the knowledge to be a pro professional photographer that may not actually have the skills to do so. And what that does is it floods the market, it floods the channels where people consume photography as a medium with mediocre or uninspiring work. This is important because it changes how people view what a photographer does. It drives down prices for photography because you have unqualified people that may charge less in order to establish some body of work. And the worst part is you may have unqualified people that charge more because they think that they are worth something that they are not. It is true that art is judged with a criticizing eye. It's very subjective. So we're not talking about right now whether images are good or bad, whether or not we have an emotional connection to them. Right now we're talking about the knowledge that your photographer should know in order to be able to charge for work and in order for you to be able to be happy with paying for work. So for the first thing that we have to understand is that photography is not a search good. In marketing we've got two different types of good. You've got a search good and an experience good. A search good is one of those types of things which you could very easily judge the value of a product, such as bread. If you go to Walmart, you can get a loaf for a buck. However, at Walmart, you can buy Wonder Bread or some other brand and pay $3. So what's the difference? You can very easily judge the quality difference. Maybe you like the thicker slices or the heavier weight of the Wonder Bread. Maybe uh, you prefer the economy of the Walmart brand. The point is, it's very easy for you as a consumer to judge what kind of a value that you're getting. Another type of a search good would be gasoline, fuel, diesel, any commodity that's purchased regularly is a great example of a search good. A good example of an experience good or something which you have to have a particular knowledge about a subject would be swords. You walk into a friend's home or a colleague's home or even sometimes some offices, some corporate offices, and you might see a sword on a sword stand. Right? Like one of those samurai swords, like a katana. How do you know if it's a good sword? You don't. I myself am a black belt in the Ida. I've been studying martial arts for over 20 years, and for five years I bought and sold swords. That's what I did. I can tell the difference between a sword that's worthy of using to tamshiguri, like cutting the mats in competition, or a sword that's worthy of just hanging on the wall. That requires a particular type of experience. You have to know about swords in order to be able to judge if you're getting a good price, to be able to judge if the value is good. And that's what I'm talking about here. With photographers, there's such a very low barrier into the photography world. 
it's hard for us to judge as consumers and even sometimes hard for us as professionals to be critical of our work to know whether or not we're either purchasing or producing something of any merit or value. Simply put, if you're going to be providing a service or purchasing a service, you should understand some things about photography. And let's get it started with lenses. And actually, let's, we're going to go ahead and erase right now this whole brand preference. Okay? Now, I like Fuji, but I've shot everything from Nikon, Canon, Olympus, Sony, and Fuji. And Fuji's my favorite after trying many different brands. I've been photographing for years. It just so happens that the first wedding <laughs> or the first digital camera I ever bought was a Fuji. And then later on in life, I shoot professionally with Fuji. The point here is simple. If you can't explain why you would use a camera, then you don't understand why you need that camera. If you can't explain why you would use a lens, then you don't understand why you would need that lens. And let's bust the brands up. So guess what? Nine times out of ten when you're buying a Canon, Nikon, Fuji, or Olympus, guess who's making the sensor? Sony. That should sink in real quick. should sink in hard. I find it hilarious because of the lack of understanding when Nikon shooters talk about the sensors in their cameras being so much better than Sony sensors, specifically for like the 7100 or 750. Sony makes the sensors for those cameras. In fact, they're not even a modified sensor. They're just the straight sensor. So it's very funny. The other thing is that people are doing special things with sensors. For example, Olympus pioneered on sensor image stabilization. At the same time, Panasonic was pioneering in lens image stabilization. Panasonic has now put in lens image stabilization and in body image stabilization into their micro four thirds cameras. They were the first to do it, at least as far as I'm aware. And they did a great job. This gets awesome stabilization for a micro four thirds camera. Well, Sony recently, a couple years ago, purchased an interest in Olympus. By that purchase and that partnership with Olympus, Sony now has new 5-axis and body image stabilization. Where do you think it came from? It came from Olympus. So camera manufacturers, specifically Olympus, Sony, and Fuji, seem to work much more closely together. Let's not forget, Canon is a Japanese company. It may be headquartered here. There may be a, a world headquarters in America, but it's a Japanese company. And this is interesting. We usually think of Nikon and Canon as very American brands. They're definitely the brand of the United States when it comes to photography. And they've got a long history of producing beautiful cameras with excellent glass. I have no issue with the ruggedness of the cameras. What I'm talking about right now is if you don't understand why you're purchasing a 5D Mark III as opposed to a Fuji X-Pro II, hmm, or a D750 from Nikon, if you're saying it's the sensor, well, Sony makes the sensors in all of them, <laughs> okay? And so that's not a good argument. You don't understand it, so you can't explain it. There are some differences, though. The X-Pro2 is a very different kind of camera than the D750, much faster, actually. It's a crop sensor camera. It has a different type of filter. It doesn't have an anti-aliasing filter, okay? The 5D Mark III, you can get the Mark IV or Mark V SR. They've got several different models, but each camera has different specifications. One thing that is very important to know here is that you purchase a camera as a tool for a specific type of job. It is true that the camera you're using should be a generalist. It should have a couple of points in the generalist category. It should be able to do certain things very well. But when you're purchasing it, it should be able to do a couple of things exceptionally well. And I think we can all see from Canon's track record, the 5D series has had an amazing record of being an all-around, weather-sealed, workhorse, digital camera with an excellent lens collection. Notice I didn't talk about it for the sensor. <laughs> because the sensor is not important when we're comparing the three cameras we talked about a second ago. Or at least... Not in this sense. We have to understand that there is a difference. If you want a very, very sharp sensor, the 24 megapixel 
APS-C sensor on the Fuji X-Pro1 has no anti-aliasing filter and has a very special type of color array. Most people, most of you, don't even know that your camera can not see color. It sees in black and white, it sees in intensity values, and it interpolates those intensity values from the color filter and then reinterpolates color later. Think about that for a second. Color is an artifact that we have to add in to the sensor, to the image, after the sensor has taken the picture. Most people, no clue. Check out cambridgeincolor.com for more information on that. You can find out that information on Wikipedia. You can go to manual sites. Uh, it's, it's all over the place. But most people have not even the foggiest clue. Let's move to something else. If you have a lens for a full-frame camera, it's an 85 millimeter f4. And then you have a lens for a micro four thirds camera. It's a 42 and a half millimeter f2. Which one's the better lens? Many people, pros alike, will immediately say that the full frame f4 lens would be better than a micro four thirds f2 lens. I mean, by the way, it's an f4, right? It's also 85 millimeter, right? It's a prime lens, right? Hmm, not bad. The Micro Four Thirds is an F2, right? But it's Micro Four Thirds. It's a smaller sensor, so it just can't render the same. That's not true. In fact, most people don't understand how to compare lenses and what the F2, F4, what that means. That's a ratio. It's a ratio for a mathematical equation to find the widest aperture, the widest physical opening possible on a lens. That's how we get it. You divide the focal length by the aperture number, the number of millimeters that the aperture is wide at its widest point, and then you come up with a number. So for example, 85 divided by 21.25 is 4. That means that an f4 85 millimeter lens has a wide aperture at f4 of 21.25 millimeters. Let's check out the other one we were talking about, the micro four thirds. What about the 42.5 f2? Well, simply, 42.5 divided by 2 is 21.25. Guess what? It's the same diameter. Both of those two lenses have a 21.25 millimeter widest aperture, physical widest aperture. So how do you compare them? They both have 21.25 millimeters wide aperture. Well, we use the ratio to talk about it. And in order to talk about it, how would you compare again, you know, F2 to F4? Well, we'd have to understand that a micro four-thirds lens is designed for a micro four-thirds camera, and the micro four-thirds camera sensor has an area smaller than that of the full frame. The multiplier in order to determine what the 35 millimeter or full frame equivalency would be in 35 millimeter terms of the micro four-thirds sensor is 2. It's a 2 times multiplier. So of course 42.5 times 2 is 85. Of course we we'll have 2 times 2 would be f4. So there we have it. Now we can compare lenses. And we get into this, you see this all the time online. You see photographers arguing about which lens is better. You see photographers using the crop factor to convert to the millimeters like the focal length, but they don't apply it to the aperture. You see photographers and a micro four thirds camera and a full frame camera or an APS-C in a full frame and doing comparisons where they have computed the aperture, where they have computed the focal length, but they left out the ISO computation. You have to compare the ISO as well because the sensor's smaller, right? So you have to apply the crop factor to the sensor as well when you're talking about exposures. So guess what? Knowledge is power. Without the knowledge, You've got no power to change the situation for the best possible results. Talking about money, we're moving on now. Just because someone charges for their work doesn't mean they should be. How do you know when an image that you look at is good? As a wedding photographer, I can tell you countless times when brides see their pictures, they're happy, they get teary-eyed. That's an emotional connection because they're remembering the day. And that saves a lot of pathetic wedding photographers. 
because the bride has an emotional connection. It means that a lot of people out there can charge for work that requires an emotional connection that would not pass the bill if it was in any other category. Advertising, guess what? That client's got no emotional connection. They want perfect work. So a crappy photo won't pass. But when a person has an emotional connection to the imagery that's being presented, crappy work can get by. I can't tell you whether or not an image is good or bad just because you like it or don't like it. I can, however, give you some criteria to help judge whether an image should be or should not be delivered. First of all, what is the focus? Very simply, the focus of the image is going to draw your eye through the image and help you look at it and understand the story of the image. So, is too much in focus? Is not enough in focus? Many pros go out there and they get a, a wide aperture lens and they take great images. Portrait photography is a great place to see it where the nose to the eyes in focus but the rest of the head is not in focus. You got a group of people together and the middle's in focus but some of the people in the picture were off the frame of focus, the focus reference and next thing you know you've got this great $2,000 f1.4 lens. You took this great picture with a really shallow depth of field but is it a portrait? Is the focus correct? I don't think so. Lots of times, even with an f1.2 or an f2, I'm taking pictures at f4, f5, 6, maybe even f8 for a large group in order to get them all in focus. Wide depth of field isn't always what you want, and it isn't the hallmark of a good image. Properly used, it can be the hallmark of a good image, but not just because. The second thing is color. What about color? You love black and white. I love black and white. Here's a secret pro tip. If it ain't right, black and white. If the color's not right, turn it to black and white. You see, as humans, our eyes are drawn to color. So if the skin tones are off, switch to black and white. Get rid of the color information. That can save a good composure and a good focus, but bad color information. However, it's a gimmick. Black and white is used way too much. If you're going to shoot for black and white, and there are amazing black and white photographers out there, they're not shooting for black and white with a, in, in color, usually. Most of the time, they're composing in black and white in their picture. Most of the time, you will notice that that color saturation of black and white, the different colors of the midtones, are still there. It's not just a black and white contrasty image that's got crushed black and, and blown out whites and a soft focus and then it's some kind of artwork. No. There are albums of images that have consistency across which show all the gradations of color from all the way black to all the way white. That's what makes a black and white image beautiful. Check that out next time you're looking at a portfolio. The last thing I'm going to talk about is composition. What does the picture tell as a story in the frame that you see? Is it cropped in too much? Is it too far out? Is there not enough information being told? Do you still wonder what's happening with the story? You know, Many things can be told in the frame, but they have to be told in the picture. You have to be able to see it. And if you've got a lot of images that are off access, at Dutch tilt, well, that's a gimmick as well. Lots of photographers out there, especially new photographers, take a picture that would be otherwise unremarkable and then they just kind of skew it, right, and crop it. Great. Now you've got a cropped in area on the camera, which means that the sensors are not going to resolve the same in a printed image. It's going to look fine on, on your computer, but it won't print very well. And they just tilted the camera in order to add some drama. It's wrong. It's not the way you would do it. You would do it in the camera. It might be a picture of taking an image of the bride and the groom kissing from a low angle so you kind of skew the camera a little bit and you can use that wide uh, perspective from the bottom looking up towards them and they're hiding their face by the by the bouquet. That's a good example of a Dutch tilt. Another one might be a bride and a groom or a husband and a wife or someone as they're hugging each other sitting in a little doorway or a barn stable and there's some horses in the background and you just kind of tilt it a little bit. You're kind of close in on it. right? That would be good. But a picture of a guy running just kind of skewed, no good. Those are three great criteria. Focus area, color saturation, color balance, and composition. 
to help you make good choices. Use those wisely. I'm going to wrap this up with two additional things to consider. Consistency across the entire portfolio. You should see perfect weddings, perfect images across the entirety of it. And there shouldn't be thousands of images. It should be hundreds of images or fewer. On a wedding, if a person is offering to deliver 1,000, 2,000 photos, that's a problem. It means that they're not curating the album. It means they're not curating your images. It definitely means they're not editing your images. And it doesn't mean they're putting a lot of time and thought into it. Also, it's a very good indication that your images are sprayed and prayed. You just put the camera on burst and hope you catch something. Those kinds of things are amateur mistakes. In sports photography, absolutely. You got to catch that ball. You know, you got to get the runner going up the court. Okay. But in weddings, there's only a couple times where you might need a burst frame rate. Otherwise, everything is pretty standard, pretty slow speed, right? And pretty known ahead of time. Lastly is planning. A good photographer will be able to plan with you with experience and be an authority on the subject, not just some guy talking about the subject. They will be able to explain to you why they're using their camera, how they're going to take pictures of your wedding. They'll be able to talk to you about images that you like and the elements which made those happen. They'll remember. They won't forget. I had a bride come up to me just the other day that I shot three years ago. I was at the park with my boys taking pictures, talking about the X-Pro1. And it was so great to see her. I remembered her right off the bat. I remember the kids, their names of their children, and I photographed over 150 brides. I remember them all. Okay, Your photographer, a good photographer, will because brides are important to you as a wedding photographer. My brides, they're important to me. They mean so much to my heart. They asked me, and I agreed, to chronicle their wedding with the eye of an historian. I got to do something for them that is special. I remember them. And it affects me that way. For your photographer that you're choosing, if it doesn't affect them similarly, they may not have the heart in it. And they may be new at it. It might be time to roll on. Guys, I'm Robert Ham with RobertHamPhotography.com. Today we've been talking about what makes a pro photographer a pro. We went over a couple of special things. Specifically, we talked about the industry and how the barriers to entry are much less today, which means that it's easier to get hooked up with a photographer that may not be worth what they're charging or may be new. We talked about ways to understand what kind of work is good work, whether or not the focus is good and draws you through the image, whether or not the image is composed properly with helps tells the story, and whether or not the color is balanced properly and not overly saturated and undersaturated. We even talked about what makes great black and white photography, and I encourage you to go find great black and white photographers. They are out there. And finally, we talked about what a professional will do and how they will speak about their work in such a way as to help lend authority to their voice rather than just someone that picked it up the other day. Whether or not you call yourself a pro as a photographer, or whether or not you consider the person you're working for as a pro, is completely up to you. However, understanding how a professional would go about photographing your event and chronicling your special day will be the determining factor for you. Guys, I hope that this has been helpful. I've enjoyed spending this time with you today. Please like and subscribe. Don't forget to catch me over on the flip side, Instagram and Twitter, at Rob Hamphoto. And as always, keep shooting, my friends.